Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and making it here. I'm Karishma. Um, my background is in design and media, where I've used um, experiences, brand, storytelling to shape culture. Um, I'm a principal at SY Partners. Uh, you might have heard about SYP yesterday in the opening, um, but we are a design and strategy consultancy that works with leaders in moments of transformation. We work with CEOs across many different industries, um, cultural, social leaders, Oprah and the Dalai Lama, to name a few. Um, and we really start with purpose. Why does an organization exist in the world? Um, and what work can we do around strategy, storytelling, brand, culture, and leadership? Um, and we work with courageous leaders, such as Anne here, who really want to make a positive dent in the universe. Um, and we really work with them to help them shape that dream um, and bring that out in the world to organizations and society at large. Um, so many of you, I don't know if you've been to the Brooklyn Museum or not, um, but yay if you have, clap if you have. Um, the Brooklyn Museum is a really special place. Um, it's a museum that's always on the cutting edge of culture, but at the same time, it's really warm and welcoming, and you see the full diversity of the borough represented there, which I have to say is pretty rare for a lot of art institutions that they are welcoming for people of all backgrounds and um, places. So I met Anne in a moment when, um, you know, the institution is such a great place, but it's really underrated. And it's not a really well-known New York institution. I think if you live there, you know it, but it's not the first place people come and visit when they're in town. And so I met Anne in a moment when, you know, she was thinking about it's, its 200th anniversary next year, which is big. And she was also trying to imagine the next 200 years. And I was really drawn to Anne for her wit, um, her courage, and you know the mischief that she holds. I think all of those are important. Um, and you've been there since 2015 as a director. I think through your um, whole career, art has always been about engaging broad audiences to motivate, inspire, and really help shift their perspectives. And you were at Creative Time before that. Um, where you commissioned large-scale installations all over New York with some really prominent artists. Um, we're so glad you're here with us today. Um, I know you've had a lot happening recently. One of them, I don't know if you guys have read the New York Times article, but is a new show called Problematic with the comedian Hannah Gadsby. Um, we'll get to that more in a second, but I bring that up because it's a great example of um, art really fostering cultural conversation. And I think that's something that you've always believed in in whatever you've done. Do you want to tell us a bit more? Yeah, well, you know, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. And thank you all for being here. We're up against Darren Walker, so I didn't think anybody would come. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I'm really grateful. And, um, you know, people often ask me, Anne, you know, where did this come from, your, you know, passionate advocacy for art and social change? And frankly, I grew up in um, a family that uh, always instilled on us this idea that you should do whatever you could in your power to leave the planet a better place. And that's a really hard thing right now. But um, I've been very lucky to uh, be a person who is passionate about all the arts, and in my career specifically in the visual arts, um, because it is culture that leads to social change. And without social change, cultural change, social change, you cannot have political or policy change. And so I want to share with you, I have my phone here because I have a few quotes I'm going to share with you at some point, um, a great quote by Abraham Lincoln. Do you all know it already? Do you know what I'm about to say? A few of you do. Uh, he really got this point about culture. He said, in this age, in this country, public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail. Against it, nothing can succeed. Whoever molds set public sentiment goes deeper than he who en enacts statutes or pronounces judicial decisions. So culture really matters, and I have been very blessed to work for great nonprofit cultural institutions that um, really get this and really believe in, yes, uplifting through beautiful experiences and inspiration, but also that are gonna lean into history, that are gonna reveal truths. And, and I have been blessed to work with boards who also get this. And in fact, I have a trustee right here, Jill Bernstein. Hello, Jill. Um, you cannot do this work if you don't have a community of supporters and a great mission who, who believe in being courageous and leaning into the times. So. Maybe that was a long-winded answer to No, I think it was great. I'm curious, when did you first realize the power of art towards social change? Oh, do we have our image? Yes, 
Okay, so when I first moved to New York in 1987, and there are probably a few of you here who were not even yet born in 1987, um, my father said to me, Annie, whatever you do, do not kiss your, or hug your gay friends. He was afraid I would, I would get HIV. And there was a lot of misinformation at that time. People thought you could get it from a toilet seat or from hugging people. My father wasn't unusual in this. And one day I'm walking down the street and I see bus, uh, a bus go by with this image by the artist collective Grand Fury. And it says, kissing doesn't kill, greed and indifference do. And this was so shocking to me for a few reasons. One, what do you mean kissing doesn't kill? My dad just told me not to kiss gay friends, right? Two, you have same-sex people kissing and mixed races. In 1987, you did not see that. I was so floored by this public artwork that was moving around the city um, that I started to question what I was being told, and my worldview began to open up, and I started to realize the more I learned and the more I started to become an activist for the first time in my life, that um, I, was un I was peeling back the layers of my social conditioning, and it's one of the great things that art has helped me to do and continues to help me to do. Is there a piece of art at the Brooklyn Museum that kind of does the same thing for you in your collection? Well, we wanted to keep it a little spicy. So, um, so I brought you an, an image of an artwork. Does anybody know who this is by? It's by the great German-American painter, Albert Bierstadt. He, and this painting in the Brooklyn Museum's collection is considered to be one of the greatest paintings of 19th century American art, if not the greatest. And I decided I'd bring this painting because it's a bit scandalous. And we'll get to that in a moment. But um, in 1866, Albert Bierstadt went on an American surveying expedition of the Colorado Rock Rockies. So it's really important that I brought an image of Colorado Rockies here to Aspen. And um, he, he, he went mostly by buggy and uh, would stop and sketch along the way, and those sketches would end up becoming these paintings, including this painting that he's created. And he was accompanied with a photographer. This is 1863, I mean, that's the early days of photography. And that photographer, Fitzhugh, Fitzhugh, let me see if I have it written down somewhere. It's gonna come to me in a minute. Why did I just forget? Oh, Ludlow, Fitzhugh Ludlow was accompanied with his wife, Rosalie Osborne. Don't forget her name. It's going to come up in a minute. So they go out to the West, sketching, taking pictures, and then eventually they make their way back to New York. And Bierstadt starts to, to make his paintings. And when he made a painting, he completed a painting like this one, he would put an ad in the local newspaper, and people could come, wait in long lines, pay their nickel, one at a time, I think it was a nickel, maybe it was a dime, one at a time, they would go through a velvet curtain, and they would have dramatic lighting, and they would look through the telescope at the great mastery of his extraordinary technical painting ability. Now, this painting is called Mount Rosalie. Remember Fitzhugh's wife's name? So part of the scandal you might think is in the title, because in fact, I'm gonna give you the page six version. You know, the readers, you know, the, the naughty version, the, the People Magazine version. In fact, um, uh, Rosalie left her husband on that fateful trip out west and ended up having a, uh, an affair with Bierstadt and they later got married. So maybe Mount Rosalie has a different meaning. I mean, there is no, <laughs> yeah, there is no mountain called Mount Rosalie in the, in the Colorado. Uh, but really that is not the true scandal. The true scandal of this painting is that it's a fictional landscape uh, with lots of stereotypes in it. Like, uh, you can't see in this image, it's a little crop, but you know, Native American people running around naked, right? This was a part of a campaign, a part of the Amer early American project to um, celebrate the great grandeur of our nat natural landscape, the great beauty of this, this country. Um, but also it was part of the American project to inspire westward expansion. When you look at a painting like this, the idea was that you would want to go westward. And we know what that led to. That led to the pain and destruction and genocide of Native American peoples.
And so, yes, we should absolutely admire the profound beauty and accomplishment of a painter like Bierstadt. But we can also hold true that there are some things that this tells us that are more difficult about who we are. We don't have to divorce truth and beauty. And so that's one of the things that we try to do at the museum is to embrace it all, to, to, keep, to keep that conversation going where we can lean in to both truth and beauty. And that's not normally a story we hear at a lot of museums. I think now it's Especially surfacing the part more about and more. The affair. Yeah. yeah, the affair, the juicy part, as yeah. well as just the impact or the effect, negative or positive, that it had on the world. Yeah. And I think, you know, through but a lot of our... Can I say yeah. something about yeah. that? Yeah. Today's audiences expect it. Yeah. You know, traditionally, we, we look to our, our um, museums as places uh, to share masterpieces, to conserve them, to educate us, and to have an authoritarian kind of view that we'd say, oh, this is what this is about. And it's often a kind of formal view, right? Today's audiences are looking, especially younger audiences, are looking for something different. They're looking for a, a pluralistic approach of, very, of diverse viewpoints, uh, for participation, for a sense of welcome, and for leaning into those difficult stories. And so we're trying to do all those things as institutions. Yeah. The nature is changing rapidly, I know, as you're experiencing that, um, being a leader in this space. Um, we came together at that moment to really, you know, talk about this. What does a museum stand for? What should it really aspire to stand for in society? And we, we did work to really uplift um, all that Broken Museum's doing, but really isn't well talked about, known about, um, you know, in a time when there are culture wars. Do you want to say a bit more about that, about the role of museum as you see that in this space? You know, when I came to the Broken Museum, and in fact, it's the last time I was at the Ideas Festival, I was invited as like the first woman in New York to lead a major uh, cultural institution. Um, and, you know, I was constantly hearing, oh, poor Anne. She does not know what she has gotten into, which, by the way, was absolutely fair and true. And, um, but, you know, we're not as big as the Met. Uh, we don't have the $4 billion endowment of the Met. We don't have all the masterpieces of the Met, though our collection is a, would be a global destination in any other city. Um, you know, we are, uh, God forbid, not in Manhattan. Uh, and we're in Brooklyn, but we're not in a trendy neighborhood of Brooklyn like Williamsburg. Uh, but we're, uh, we're in central Brooklyn. But don't worry, Anne, it's gentrifying. <laughs> Um, and, and the Brooklyn Museum had, there, there's a lot of problems with that. Uh, and the Brooklyn Museum had promoted itself as number two to the Met. And you know what? We're not number two to the Met. Maybe actually your museum, Philadelphia Museum, is number two to the Met, right? It's just, if you haven't been, such an extraordinary museum. And, and so I thought, who wants to be number two? What can we be number one at in a city of extraordinary museums? What can we do that's additive? And then it finally came to me. You know, it's, it's, a, it's about owning who we are. It's about being in Brooklyn. You know, when you think about Brooklyn, what are those, thing, those adjectives that you think of? Diversity, inclusion, sense of humor, chutzpah, moxie, whatever you want to call it, a curiosity, intellectual, an open-mindedness. That is what Brooklyn stands for. And guess what? New York City, this country, and I think the world, needs more museums that are more like Brooklyn. And so we started to experiment with what that could look like and really leaning in to bringing the past in conversation with the present and taking on taboo subject matters that other museums don't or won't. Um, and guess what? Our theory of change is working. Our audiences have more than doubled. Our giving has, I think, more than doubled at this point. Our global press is really off the charts. So to your point, we have a lot more to do. And with the 200th anniversary coming up, you know, this is our moment to really clarify and celebrate who the Brooklyn Museum is and to no longer say we're number two. Yeah, and I think in a time when books are being banned, um, you know, other cultural things where we're not allowed to talk about certain topics, I think you've really held that space to go there. At times, it's not always popular. It's not always easy. It's actually quite difficult to lead through that. If Dr. Fauci can do it, I can yeah. do it. <laughs> I saw him yesterday. Did you all see him yesterday? <laughs> Gave me courage. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think through our work, we really wanted to, you know, 
put on a pedestal what you're doing work-wise at the Brooklyn Museum to tell that story, and then also really to build on that more and increase your impact around what are those principles in anything that anyone touches in the museum, any experience, they should feel that, whether they come to a dance party or if they actually come to a talk that's um, speaking to the moment politically, culturally. Um, but you know, that's all in theory. We wanted to actually show some examples of what shows are we um, that you guys have done in the most recent times um, that really speak well to this. Oh, do you, but you want to talk about the principles? Yeah, we could talk about the principles. Yeah. I think, you know, this really, I think, speaks to the core of what makes Brooklyn Museum that Brooklyn way of being. So, for example, anything that you should do should expand the narrative. Um, what is the untold story that we're liberating that adds nuance or complexity? We don't want to hear the same story again and again. What are we presenting that's different? Um, another one I love is cultivate, cultivate wonderment. How do you engage anyone in a multi-sensory experience that really moves them that they want to share that experience with someone else? I think how art sparks change, that's a really important part around bringing more people into the fold. Are there any others that are your favorites too in them? Well, one of the things that we really struggle with is ritual. Yeah. And so when you use the word ritual, when we, were, when we were meeting and I thought, ritual, ritual, what does that have to do with the museum? And then I slept on it and it was really one of the most uh, uh, profound because it's one thing to be an innovator and a disruptor in the field. It's another thing to make those uh, actually constant practices because that's part of the real work. But I also want to say, um, and, and Rick, you know this about me. We'll sit down and I'll, you'll say we have 30 minutes and two hours later I'm still talking your ear off. And I, there's so much passion that I want to share, you know? And you guys really listened with great care and, and digested what the team and I shared with you. And you came up with three defining themes or narratives for the museum. And we thought about them really deeply together. And we finally came up with the Brooklyn Way and it felt so authentic to us. And I just wanna say thank you for listening with such great care and helping us get clear on not, and not putting everything in the kitchen sink. Yeah. So I'll be better in the future, Rick. <laughs> no promises, anyway. <laughs> Thank you. And also, it's easy when you work with a leader that's as courageous and well-spoken and very clear in their thinking. Um, but let's, let's bring that to life for people. I think the, one, the exhibition we mentioned early on is It's Problematic, um, which I'm sure you've heard a lot of press about. And, and you knew it was going to be controversial. I think you expected that. Um, I love this quote that you mentioned in, in the Times article that, you know, if you want to see hundreds of Picassos, go to Paris. But if you want a real conversation that's interesting, come to Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, so we're going to just play a quick video to give you context of it. And then, Anne, I'd love to hear what the conversation was that you were hoping to spark through this show. Great. Oh, hello. I'm Hannah Gadsby, the Australian, the comedian, the screechy feminist Ted talking ruiner of man fun. And I'm here at the Brooklyn Museum. Nice. Why would they let a comedian loose in a world-renowned art institution? Great question. Probably because I'm co-curating an exhibition about Pablo Picasso. That's right, the famous misogynist Picasso. I've changed. He's been dead for 50 years now. Womp womp. Nothing to do with me. I wasn't even born yet. And we thought it's about time we take a good look at him from another angle, a feminist angle, a comedic angle. Fresh. Come check it out. It's problematic, get it? At the Brooklyn Museum now through September 24th. Well, we knew this was going to be controversial, and sure, it sure has been. Um, so just a little background on the exhibition. Um, the, the French and Spanish governments, along with the Picasso administration, which is primarily the Picasso family, which has given their blessing to this exhibition. You can't do a Picasso show without their blessing. Um, or at least you can't say the name Picasso without their blessing. Uh, and um, uh, they, they, for the 50th anniversary of Picasso's passing, invited 50 museums around the globe to organize exhibitions. We were invited kind of late in the day, so all the major paintings were taken, and most of my colleagues would whisper to me, we can't do a big Picasso show anymore, we'll get canceled. And, uh, and uh, um, 
And a lot of them are doing little shows. Uh, things like, you know, there's a great little show up at the Guggenheim right now. It's on the year 1900 when Picasso moved to Paris. And so you see, I don't know, maybe 10 paintings um, from 1900, and it's glorious. And I'm an art historian. I love those art historical nerdy shows. But I thought to myself, what do we add to this conversation? What, what can the Brooklyn Museum bring to this? And listen, we were invited because they wanted us to bring something a little spicy to the conversation. And it wasn't lost on, on us that 1973, the year that Pablo Picasso died, was the height of the second wave of feminism. That this is the time period where women art historians like Linda Nochlin and women artists really started to, to you know, uh, uh, build some traction. And so we thought, why don't we take a feminist less, uh, look at Picasso? And at this time period, where the left and right are shouting at each other, oh, anti-wokeism, da 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 da, and you know, banning books and firing teachers for showing Michelangelo's David, and you know, trying to end critical race theory being taught in schools, it's so bad out there right now. We said, why don't we just bring all the points of view together? We have you know, very diverse audiences, they, all generations, all backgrounds, let's bring them together, embrace the conversation, and then let them make up their minds for themselves. So why did I know this was gonna be controversial? Well, one, the art world doesn't like it when you, you, you try to alter or expand a conversation about one of the great geniuses. And by the way, if you think historically only men are great geniuses, and we should call that into question. Okay, anyway, I'm off topic. Two, um, because it's this time period of anti -woke, so called anti wokeism, and um, a lot of men have had to be quiet between the Me Too movement and uh, you know, George Floyd and all these kind of social reckonings, this is their moment to go, ah ha ha, anti wokeism, I'm going to shout again. And so, um, so uh, Jill may remember that about six weeks before the show opened up, I had a conversation with our board. We had an emergency phone call, and I said, hey, I want to just give you a heads up. The show is going to be controversial. Um, the press is uh, uh, talking about this exhibition, assuming we want to cancel Picasso. Of course, we don't want to. Picasso is a great artist. Even Hannah Gadsby has said he's undeniably a great artist over and over again. Uh, but, um, but it was clear that they decided that we were being woke and that um, we were canceling Picasso. And so I said to everybody, we're going to hold firm on the importance of bringing people together to have a conversation. Everybody is th struggling with this question of, well, not everybody is struggling, but you know, having this conversation. Can I still dance to Michael Jackson's, Jackson's PYT at my friend's wedding when I know he's a pedophile? How about Roman Polanski or Woody Allen? Like, can we still love the art when we know the person had done some terrible things? Right? So, so of course, um, the second the show opens, we get to the worst review of all time in the New York Times. I don't love having my institution attacked. I don't like my curators to be attacked. But since we knew it was going to happen, I already had a uh, opinion piece that was going out in the art newspaper to defend our, our very clear position on this. And, and, you know, let the fun begin. And so there was uh, a few critics that came out with really disastrous exhibition. I mean, it's a small show. And how could it really be that disastrous? And, um, and, um, and then the, a backlash started, right? Where people were saying, I, I saw the show. I thought it was really thoughtful. I learned a lot. And actually, it was really affirming for me. And, and so, the, so people are coming with their feet. They're, they're coming into the museum. Uh, there's lines every afternoon to get in, to see the exhibition. And, and the comments have been really strong. And this is what we wanted to do. We didn't shy away from the conversation. We said, let's have it. Um, and that's a, that takes, a, again, a very strong board. Um, because you know they don't like to have their friends, I'm sure, say to them at dinner party, what has your institution done? Or they don't like to see bad press. But our board has been so consistently strong, saying these are the important conversations to have. Go for it. Well, that conversation is out there and happening yep, now. Happening. So I think you've achieved the goal that yep. you wanted to and around contending with history, questioning um, figures that we've kind of known and heard things about in our lives. Um, oh, can I say one more yeah. thing about that? I think it's additive. I think when you have these conversations, it doesn't take away from our, our reading of Picasso's art or any artist's work. It's additive. It enhances it. And that for us was really important to get across. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about another example that I think is also worth um, sharing and talking about. 
Um, one of, I think one of the main areas of social issues um, in your social impact agenda is the climate crisis and climate justice. And so you brought Brooklyn-based artist Duke Riley to really examine our relationships um, to plastics in our life. Um, I think we have a video that we'd like to show of Duke actually walking through the exhibit and hearing about the art from his voice. Hi, my name is Duke Riley. Welcome to my show at the Brooklyn Museum. It's called Death to the Living, Long Live Trash. Let's go take a look. The title of the exhibition, Death to the Living, Long Live Trash, was actually inspired by a uh, piece of scrimshaw that I saw years ago at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, which they were kind enough to lend us for this exhibition. And the, uh, if you look at it, the, the inscription on the tooth says, death to the living, long live the killers, success to sailors' wives, and greasy luck to whalers. Whale oil was basically like the, the fossil fuel of its time. And in the pursuit of wealth, this very small group of people almost uh, decimated the entire species of animals off the, the face of the, the planet. These different people that were the, the ones that were often depicted on these teeth were often prominent members of society, you know, ship owners and people that profited off of the, uh, the, the, uh, the whale oil industry. I started making my own scrimshaw out of plastic objects that I was finding on the beaches around New York City and decided to start putting various CEOs of some of the, the companies that are most responsible for producing this stuff and kind of trying to focus on who the people were that were really most responsible for the proliferation of single-use plastic that's basically decimating our waterways um, throughout the world now. A friend of mine who was a commercial fisherman told me that he had this diving fin in his garage in Cape Cod uh, that had been there since the early 90s and that it had actually been found inside the stomach of a tiger shark. It's no surprise that some of these objects that we use day to day would be actually consumed by a fish whole because uh, I started looking at them and thinking they don't really look that much different than the commercial fishing lures that people use to, to go sport fishing. Also just kind of thinking about what a lure is and that it is basically this uh, hunting tool that uses the, the psychology or the desire of this animal against itself. And I was thinking about then these objects themselves, how all of them you know, have been designed in a way, be lured to them ourselves to purchase them as we are constantly trying to reconnect with nature and that coupled with our own addiction to convenience, how we're sort of constantly seeking out more of these things and then bringing them out into the natural world and ultimately uh, kind of destroying the thing that we are chasing after. I love this show. So the, the museum has a social action strategy, actually, and um, we're, in addition to all the conversations taking place at the museum, there's, you know, uh, uh, exhibitions that deal with mass incarceration and mass criminalization and the Great Migration and uh, women's reproductive justice and, you know, climate and, you know, all, there's, uh, there isn't an exhibition that's not leaning into the past and the, and the present day conversations, right? Um, but one of the things that's so great about having a, a social social action plan for the museum is that we're staying committed rather than coming in and out on two issues, uh, one of them being around climate and the other being around mass criminalization. Um, and one of the things it does is not only do we get to engage the public in some of these histories and what's happening today, um, it and, and we work with partner organizations like the New York Aquarium to help with their, you know, just legislative efforts and those kinds of things. But it also changes us internally. The amount of work we've had to do to really significantly reduce our plastics consumption um, is, is profound. Uh, and so the work is not just external facing, it's really internal facing too.
And I think it's sitting with that tension of our relationship with nature and what we're doing to that. And it's not perfect. I know as an institution, you're hosting that dialogue. It causes reflection. But yeah. I think sitting in that tension and constantly reevaluating will actually create change. So I think um, the ongoing efforts that you're doing around the climate crisis are kind of working towards that. Um, there's one more exhibition that we'd also like to show you. Um, I think the kinds of issues that you take on at the museum are far and wide. Going back to what you just mentioned, mass criminalization, I think one of the first shows that you did was with Brian Stevenson of EJI to talk about the connections between issues around mass incarceration today and how that actually goes back to the legacy of lynching in our history. And I don't know if you want to share context before we watch this video. Yeah, I just uh, simply say trigger warning. Um, we're not showing any images here of lynching, but it is a very uh, um, shockingly painful topic. And so um, just wanted to let you know that, that there's a, a bit of context in that as we watch this. There are these things we do not talk about, and our silence is creating a burden in America. I don't think any of us are free. And I think we've got to do something to get closer to freedom. And that means we have to talk about some things we haven't talked about. My great-grandfather, Thomas William Miles Sr., was lynched. It's shocking to me that there's very few places in this country where you can go and have an honest experience with the history of slavery. There are no places you can go and have an honest experience with the history of lynching. And I think that has to change. I think we really do have to create those spaces. You know, I was in front of that map. My grandmother left Selma, my grandfather left Tuskegee, and I never thought about it quite that way, you know, to think like this is what they grew up in. It's a very powerful experience, actually. You can take in history and data, if you will, and then have another experience with the art. All of these elements can work together. The reason why we are here, we want to liberate America for its history, but we can't get to liberation without truth. You can't get to reconciliation without truth. We're going to do something better in this nation. We're going to get to a better place. Wow, I have shivers every time I hear Brian speak, and if you've never had the, the um, life-changing experience of having Brian, uh, listening to Brian, please make it a life priority. He actually, when he did that talk for the Brooklyn Museum, had seven standing ovations within 20 minutes. Seven standing ovations. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Anyway, we knew that he was building a memorial and museum to the legacy of lynching in Alabama. And um, he came to us and said, uh, I'm going to uh, do this little exhibition in Chelsea. And I said, nobody's going to come see it, and it's the wrong context. And he did it anyway. And then he came back and said, you were right. Uh, and can we do something at the museum? So we turned around a, an exhibition in three months, which uh, I, I don't think I could ever do to my staff again. Um, and what we did is we showed the research that his team has been working on for years of these sites that hadn't been recorded before of where lynchings happened. And, um, and, and these testimonial interviews that they had done. And what we did is we brought um, art from our collection into the conversation from artists who um, have also said, we can't afford to look away. And I just wanted to share, you know, just because I get nervous public speaking, I wanted to share this great, great quote from James Baldwin um, that um, has been really very defining for me. Can't find it, but it's that quote that basically is: um, if 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 we don't lean into history, we can't fix it. It'll come to me in a minute. I'll find it afterwards. But at any rate, so these are all or artists who have said to us: don't look away. We cannot change history if we don't face history. And so you have Kara Walker in the f foreground, or Titus Kaphar with his Jerome series in the background. The other image we showed, um, you know, is this extraordinary piece by Sanford Biggers on lynching itself that's in our collection. Um, and so, so it was an opportunity for people to kind of marry how artists were dealing with this topic historically with actual data and testimonials. It was a really moving experience and generations of people came together, great grandparents and grandparents and you know, et cetera, to really share in their family histories with one another. It was quite remarkable. And I think what you guys do well is you pick a social issue, you curate around it, what is the conversation we're trying to have? Also, how do you build in other, like the Brian Stevenson talk at the same time? What other activities? How do we engage all audiences that are coming to the museum 
to be with you in that conversation. I think it's very easy to go to an art exhibition at another museum, see something, walk away, but not fully really grap uh, grapple with it. Um, and I think, I think we and all museums have much further to go to not just point yeah. to issues, but actually to partner with those in community who have been doing the work historically to help amplify their work and support their work, uh, to really listen, ha have them help construct the narratives as well, um, and to give people tangible things to do. When, when they leave the museum, that whether it's around voting or it's about advocating locally or just even having conversations with people at the dinner table about the things that they've learned. How do we help people take that learning outside of that moment in the museum and into their lives, into the world? Yeah. We want to open it up for a very quick Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions, but after that, we're going to kind of engage in a conversation and exercise together where we'll all speak with one another. But any questions that come up for anyone? Raise your hand if so. so program, you, have, you have a mic there you can um, use to speak so everyone can hear you. Program, there was a discussion about how arts can play a central or should, should play a central role in encouraging diverse views. What you've done at the museum is fantastic, and I suspect most of us, if not all of us, agree with the point of views you've presented. But they're not diverse views. I mean, the, the Picasso encouraged outside the museum diverse views. What can museums, or should museums, in, and can museums do to encourage a discussion of diverse views? Well, I, I totally agree with you, but I will say that of the, and I should have said this before, of the 51 women artists in the Picasso show, Almost all of them say they love Picasso. So we actually did <laughs> embrace diverse views. But I do think, you know, I was at a, a, a session right before this one, and I saw the one this morning as well, um, where they're talking about how do we have conversation together? And I think that um, museums historically are not actually great storytellers, and we have to become better storytellers. Um, we need more diverse views shaping. Uh, how the curators are thinking through those stories. And I think we need to give people opportunities when in the museum, in our gallery spaces, to actually converse with one another. And we don't do that well. So for example, on the Picasso show, sure, people can write on little cards what their views and thoughts are in the moment, but how do you really construct space that helps people across differences um, really be in conversation with one another. And I don't have an answer to that, but I will say that being here the past two days has inspired greater thinking about how we might do that. And I do think that um, it is extremely important in an art world that tends to lean politically one way, and the Picasso reaction has actually proven that we don't really completely lean in that way, but nevertheless, um, um, that it is really important that we are, we are public institutions, we must lean into all valid points of view and to really embrace them to construct those stories. So I don't have an answer for you, but I'm aware of the, the opportunity. Thank you. I have a, I have a question about um, the thought process around not getting trapped in analysis paralysis. So if you have a view you know, on the one hand, you might not be woke enough. I mean, you could very easily risk the, the accusation that, you've, that you're whitewashing or you're covering up, or on the other hand, that you're too woke and you're trying to serve an entire community that is very diverse. So how do you strike that balance? Uh, and is it, does it come from, is it innate or is it, is, does that go through a, through a different process? It's such a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons among the many that other institutions are more conservative because no good deed goes unpunished. So if you just don't change, you're less likely to have any kind of you know, reaction to what you're doing. But at the Brooklyn Museum, we have a diverse board and we have a diverse staff. And we come together and we have conversations. People ask questions, they challenge us, and we try to craft the best story we can. Also on a lot of big exhibitions, we bring in community members of different points of view to help us. So we're never gonna please all people. But if, if you don't want the status quo to be questioned, we are not your institution. There are other institutions for you to go to. But if you want to see that kind of richness and tension, then you come to the Brooklyn Museum and we're not gonna get it even, you know, 75% right, right? What did that mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a sign, I don't know what it was a sign of though. Uh, so, you know, not even 75% right, but, but at least 
at least we're recognizing it and trying to figure it out together. And what happens is when you put a spotlight on these things, it gives the next organization or the next artist an opportunity to do better and to go further. And we know that people are looking very carefully at our work. We hear this all the time from our colleague museum institutions, uh, not just in New York, but around the country and around the world. And it helps them dip their toes into the water too. Talk to Michael. <laughs> I, I think I'll just add, I think that's also just core to the ethos that we kind of elaborated on uh, that really makes it Brooklyn. It's imperfect. I think it's, it's better to do that, take a risk. You might not land it the right way, but you're holding space to have that conversation and to improve to get there. I think just to add on to what you're sharing, I think that's a core ethos. Absolutely. Was there another question? Uh, program programmatically, uh, LACMA is changing. A lot of the curators are gone, and they're doing affinity groups based on, uh, uh, could be from different parts of the world, different times, but there's a common theme to all of them. So you'll never go to LACMA again and see American arts in one area, Latin arts in another area. Uh, it's something I think is more radical than's been done before besides the controversy over the new building, the actual programming will be a lot more interesting to see how it comes out. I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that. You know, I think a lot of institutions are experimenting, so they're starting to um, get rid of traditional departments like photography and painting and sculpture and mixing things up. Um, and you see it in exhibitions or you'll see it in collection installations. I actually, I, I love Michael. I think he's doing an incredible job and I, I'm lucky to have some very extraordinary colleagues in the field. He's, he's among them. Um, I haven't heard that they're changing that, so I'm looking forward to talking to him about it. Um, I, I still think that it's very valid to have an American art department because there are issues and histories that are specific to us, but how you bring in other narratives that connect is also very valid. So I'll, I'll be curious to see, to learn more about what's happening. It helps if you're an encyclopedic museum and you can pull in from different cultures from a different period right. to create something interesting. That's right. I agree with you. I think we have time for one more question. Is there one more? Hi, um, my name is Stefano. I just wanted to say thank you for your time. I'm a huge fan of the Brooklyn Museum. Oh, thank I go you. all the time with my friends and my partner. Do you live in Brooklyn? Uh, I live in Harlem. Yeah, I live in Harlem. We have a very yeah. large audience from Harlem. For sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Thank you. But I, I wanted to ask, uh, you, you touched upon uh, the community engagement that you guys have been looking forward to doing. And I've been noticing that there have been a lot of uh, community events at the Brooklyn Museum, uh, some that are, um, I think, coordinated, or a friend of mine, uh, Romina uh, Beltran Lazo, who works with the Brooklyn Museum, might contribute to. But I, I wanted to hear more about um, these community events and and how have you guys been, or what, what the reception has been like? You know, when I came to the museum, as much as we had probably the most uh, diverse audience of any major museum in the country, uh, there was still a great deal of distrust. You're dealing with 200 years of history and, and you know, upholding white supremacy in particular narratives, et cetera. Um, but I think that that has been melting away as people see what the museum is doing through exhibitions, through collections, and as you say, through events. So um, not a day goes by where we're not doing something with and uh, with community. So for example, on the weekends, we um, started a outdoor market. And, um, you know, it's not tube socks and sausages. It's local, you know, everybody in central Brooklyn has, has a side hustle, right? Like, and, and many people in, in Brooklyn have more than one side hustle. And so how can you give them an opportunity with an audience to sell their creative wares, whether it's the candles or potions or their fashion designer or their jewelry, and help them achieve their sort of creative dreams? So we do that every single weekend all throughout the year. Um, we, you know, host lots of different types of community events where we'll, you know, 5,000 people showed up to Juneteenth on Sunday, last Sunday, and, um, you know, there's a lot of outreach and listening and care and partnership that goes into it. So, you know, one of the things that was really interesting to me was that during COVID, um, you know, we did what 
some other institutions have done. We opened up a, a food pantry in back of the museum. Um, uh, and for six months, we didn't give away meals, we gave away cases and cases of fresh organic food um, so that people could feed a family of five for the week. And uh, when all the toy drives had been canceled, uh, we put together one massive toy drive. I want to say that our trustees basically kept uh, toy shops in central Brooklyn afloat that year because they bought all, over 5,000 brand new toys for our local youth. We continue to do it now every year. If there's, let's say, uh, an earthquake in Haiti, and we have a lot of Haitian neighbors, we'll do a big clothing and supplies drive. When uh, asylum seekers come to New York, we overwhelmed with our supply drives, the local churches, and they stopped, asked us to stop giving them things. Uh, um, and so we just, it was like a, a month early for Christmas for the local homeless shelters. There's just so much that's invisible to the public uh, that we do on a daily basis. And what's not invisible are, is First Saturdays, which I think are a huge hit. Lines outside the you know museum around the block. Um, so I think you celebrate joy, you're there for when people need you as well. Um, I think yep. it's the full range of what the community needs and meeting them there. That's right. All right, so we're now gonna do an exercise with all of you. Um, we picked a topic that's, I think, relevant, very relevant, front and center to this you know, festival together and as well as, as at the museum, which is around democracy um, and the constant state of it in our society. And conversation, you're gonna talk to each other. Yeah. yeah. But we w thought we'd start with this one piece to kind of spark ideas for all of you. If Anne, you want to give a little context about it. Uh, so this is an artwork that was call called Commons that was created in 2011 by an artist who happens to be a Brooklyn artist named Paul Ramirez Jonas. And Paul had been doing a series of um, artworks about, guess what? monuments, and in particular, Confederate monuments, before it was quite the hot topic that it has become. And he did a lot of performances around this, talking about the history of these Confederate monuments in whatever city he was lecturing in, and really questioning the idea of who do we heroize, and why, and who belongs on the proverbial uh, um, horse. And so, um, and so here he's created a horse with nobody sitting on top of it. The whole sculpture is made out of cork, and the public is invited to add whatever they want to the sculpture. And so we installed this during COVID, and people put in their drawings, they um, put in their birth control. Maybe not the best of ideas. <laughs> um, there, I got vaccinated buttons, there, I voted stickers, all sorts of things. And it's the idea of really rethinking what does a public monument look like in democracy? And so we thought we'd ask you to think about the future of democracy in America. Yeah. So that's a big topic, but you know, just to warm you up, um, you'll find some materials where you're seated. Um, First, we wanted you to just first reflect on your relationship and your personal experience towards a topic such as this. So just, just to say, when it comes to democracy, what discourages you and what gives you hope? Um, just take a few minutes, write down some whatever comes to mind on that piece of paper, and then we'll let you know what you're gonna do next. And if you have any questions, please ask. And these thoughts are just for yourself. You're not going to share them with anyone. So don't feel like, you know, I can't write that. I don't want to talk about it. Just, it's just, just to kind of get you thinking. All right. After you've written some thoughts down, um, you'll see an envelope right there. And if you open it up, there's a card inside. And it has a prompt for you to fill out. So if you were to think 20 years from now, what is the future you imagine for democracy in our country? So write a what if question related to that. So it could be a provocation, such as what if we got rid of the electoral college? It could be any kind of provocative thought in that way. It could be a what if associated to something that you're worried about or that discourages you. Or it could be a question around something that gives you hope. It, it's really open, but I think thinking about if you could imagine the future of democracy, what is a question that comes up for you? Could it be, what if there is no democracy? Yeah. And don't overthink it. Write down the first thing that comes to mind for you. 
Don't put it back in the envelopes yet. We're going to use those. <laughs> All right, we're going to have people collect those cards from you. And what we're going to do is give you, we're going to exchange them. So don't put your name on it. Keep it anonymous. We're, you're going to get someone else's card in the room to see what their thought is. And you will not know who it's from. So um, if you're able to collect them from either side of the room. So on the left side of the room and on the right side of the room, share it out to whoever's walking by to pick it up. I can't wait to hear what people said, I know, actually. I know. This is smart, self-selecting smart group of people. <laughs> and then you're going to share that out with other people on the other side of the room. While we're doing that, Karishma, can I finally share my favorite James Baldwin quote that I was too neurotic to yeah. remember? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Oh, I just shut it down. Wait a second. Okay, got it. You, you've, you've heard this quote before. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. All right, so you're going to be receiving someone else's card. Um, read the prompt that they've written there. Um, and then we want you to turn to someone next to you. So ideally someone that you didn't come with to this talk, someone that you haven't met before. And we want you to just, each of you, share the question that you received and talk about any um, emotions, thoughts, ideas that it sparks for you. Personal in conversation, experience Personal experiences as well. Yep. Um, and, you know, I think just some ground rules. You may or may not agree with the question or the idea posed there. Um, but the thought is to really, you know, ask questions, be curious, and pause before you um, cast any judgment. And if anyone can't find someone to talk to or do this with, we can also lead you. Or you can move around the room. It sounds like a lot of conversation is happening across the room. But we, we'd love to ask if any group or person would like to share something that you guys have been discussing. That would be great for the rest of us to also hear. Any brave souls? We wanted to hear any of the conversations that different groups are having to just share to the rest of the room. Um, would you like to share? <laughs> uh, okay. um, a lot of our conversation revolved around uh, dialogue across difference and how to connect with one another with curiosity um, and the word love was actually written down um, while also recognizing the past and trying to be part of it. There was a spirited convert or to, to face it, uh, to interrogate it. There was a spirited conversation about democracy and pride in country um, mm. and what that means today, what that might mean tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. For Anything sharing. else over there? Hi. So we had a great conversation. A lot of it was about the dialogue issue. Um, and I think what that brought to mind, y you were much more optimistic. I was more pessimistic about all the structural barriers are, that are, that exist <laughs> around, um, you know, how social media exacerbates differences and money in politics exacerbates differences and all the things you'd have to dismantle institutionally to get to a very simple but idealistic outcome. I think. Yeah. No, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else? We talked a lot about politics, but we also talked about what a participatory... Uh, we talked about what a participatory constitution would look like, and we kind of decided that perhaps we should revert to the model that some other countries use where, you know, an election is really something you have to do. So participatory would mean that everyone really voted. And you could use a model like Colorado where you have, um, you know, vote in elections. I mean, they're very good about getting, getting everything to you in your mailbox. You get to fill it out. You get to put it back in your mailbox and your vote is counted. And if everybody in this country did vote, perhaps we would have a different kind of country. It's a great one. I kind of want to close on that. That's a wonderful last thought. Participatory constitution. Yeah. You heard it here. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, so, Krishna and I just want to say thank you for spending a little bit over an hour with us um, and thinking about the role of culture in shaping social change. And many of you are deeply involved with cultural institutions. Some of you are trustees on boards of cultural institutions. Some of you run foundations. And, um, you know, we're, we're headed into uh, messy times. We're in messy times. I think they might get messier. And to be stalwart, about the importance of people coming together and embracing pluralistic views and leaning into the important conversations. This is the work ahead of us. So I just wanted to say thank you for being in it with us and spending some of your day with us when there were so many extraordinary offerings at Aspen Ideas. And um, when you come to Brooklyn or come to New York, come visit me at the Brooklyn Museum. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.